you know, certain kinds of civilizing acts of violence. Um, so I don't have an Easter poem, but I do have a Christmas poem. Christmas. Took a tab, two baths, hypnosis. Took a bus to People's Beach. Kelp washing up like old romance. Took note of color, of filaments departing. Winter pelicans. Various other holiday solitude. Took myself to task recalling you are never the only person who has an idea. What begins in what you think is novelty becomes fraternal with someone disappearing. The stranger carries with them what you don't know how to put down, much less name. What a city is, is at least occasionally relief in between survival, rare glory, mundane calamity, even or especially here at its coast where dreams go, grief, intention, memories of endlessness. The moon rises. The way you can never take its picture, though of course you want to, is how I feel for language. Physical regard for a mystery that comprises me, like an organ in relation to a mind. Sometimes I say something precisely because I do not understand what I am saying. This year, instead of a resolution, I dream a word. It isn't narrative or visual or a feeling or a symbol. It is honor, just that, something I know nothing of. Dark, like a beach beyond its seasons of pleasure, bright with freedom from the fear of how will I arrive where I need to go. Need dissolves, then going, I do. What drugs do you take them? They take you, that vast plane of objecthood at the edge of the habitual single subject. Standing here, I'm hoping everyone remembers the first time someone made them feel beautiful, how beauty feels moving through you out. Now it's not the beach, I'm at the orgy, Christmas orgy. Often I'm afraid my antennae are directed to who I perceive doesn't know how to be here. No one anywhere does, but tonight it turns out I do know this person, or did. We're trying to figure out what surprises one another. Surprise, I'm staring at you, and right, we went to college together. Timmy, well, no, I'm Tim now. Oh, Tim, okay, I'm still just Kyle. Are you laughing or gasping when I'm at your neck? I never know myself. Good, yeah, 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 no, I'm sorry, Tim says. I'm sorry, I'm just feeling sort of, yeah, no, I say, self-conscious. He goes, of course, yeah, I've been there, I say. Do you want to get away a second? Yes, yeah, I think that would be good, sure. It's just, he says, I haven't really done this sort of thing before, and I thought I wouldn't know anyone, and then you, but we hardly write, but I had this idea, and it was 10 years ago. I just had this idea I was going to be in kind of a different place tonight. And then I'm with you, and it puts me in this place I was 10 years ago, and I don't want to be in that place anymore. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I just, when I knew you then, I felt like I would see you at these parties and I didn't think of myself as someone who was very good at making friends. So, I never felt like we were friends. Oh, I never thought of you that way, though. Yeah, but I, did of myself. I always thought you seemed great. I think you seem great now. I think I'm probably going to go now. Yeah, good night, Timmy, Tim. Orgy, good night, red lanterns, revelers, tennis courts and gargoyles, beautiful people eating dinner alone, shop goers at the tchotchke marts. We think we'll feel someone forever from things alone or we want them to feel us and this is why we give them to them. We put 
into things, the ideas of places, a place in time, this moment I wanted to say, you make me want to think, even now as thinking escapes me, hope persists. I hope that time is revealed over time, though I'm opening nothing today. This has not been a year without gifts. Of course I'm opening, I always am. Doesn't it all go to vinegar, Margaret? The calisthenics, the records, the portioning of pleasure, the karmic deals we make with no one but ourselves, and the conviction that a secret can manifest a force of absolute and inevitable justice or work can, the raft I call supposed to, the fractures, the splintered obligations whose notions of purpose lodge stupidly in the ball of my foot, so intractable the pain becomes the given, the duty, I mean the point, so I water the plants, so I move the papers from this pile to that pile, I sever my habits from all of my devices, I sever my reliance upon food subsidized by corn and other sugar giants, I don't go there anymore anywhere that requires an emission above a certain threshold. I cut what makes me sluggish or enacts a kind of harm, which I regret to say is kind of all there is, is harm I regret to say, I say, and say it all the same. And this accomplishes what? The admission, the down to zeroing. I have made my sutra speech the follicles of behavior, the die, should I say, processed. I imagine in an assembly line of adolescent goths I have been at different intervals, the kiddo, all of me, piddling up inertia with a constant want machine. If harm is how I spend more than half my life, what does that mean for me democratically? Meaning is democratic, yes or no, determined I mean by the most of us or the more of us at least, or if I am more than half my life asleep, does that become reality? Can it? Could we just say the real is governed by the majority or gerrymandered by the algorithms of our various lonelier and lonelier diets? Or shall we acknowledge that judgment by systems of half fail us as much as nomenclature by systems of two fail? I fall, I let the limbs go before the mind imposes fall. I fill myself with nothing where nothing was and then I breathe again as I have since I was born the most minimal thing I can do that qualifies as living. Nothing fixes everything, but there is no future without breathing or watering or falling. And so the three I do, I bind them as I do my enemy, my ancestor, my beloved, my other past beloveds, the stranger whose face I have carried since the morning, the first person who appears when I pose the question, who have I forgotten and forsaken and for whom am I grateful and who may need the courage I do not know how to send but do I turn them and myself to the wild sorrel, the lupines in the north of the northern hemisphere, all turning toward the midnight sun in summer, a place without a future, without clock, watch, phone, computer, job, rent, debt, property, and I ask my friend, the temporary monk, in your time here, what was time? It was need, she said, and aid, and did you feel more connected or less to the people you were here with? Relative to what, she said, beckoning adherence, where before was only opposition, pulverizing the whole into particles like ants moving hopelessly in a line beneath a magnifying glass. When it follows you this way, there is no distinguishing instrument from power, from the one who wields it, the one cruel sun, the man, and the burning that I am with you and you, we who everywhere make pestilence and green alike spiraling up through the floorboard out of structure into momentum, a house of going, of wind, of falling and rising, meeting, cresting, tangling, breathing, falling, breaking, circling, breathing, a house of mouths passing breath between them, us two mirrors which make together infinite the distance, the intensity of a very brief moment at the moment we decide to make it memory, watching shadows of leaves in the park while the harp goes and piano. I 
decide a particular hot lavender setting left across the avenues. I decide being read to, held, made love to, while upside down through the window's blue square. I watch an airplane. I decide to remember what is here and is unfathomable there, multiple leaving or arriving. I decide I am object and subject at once. I decide, and this is the rationale that speech constitutes itself, a material, but a decision is not an object, nor is vow, nor promise. You cannot hear, touch, taste, give away, possess it. It can mean nothing. I love it anyway. It can do nothing. I do it anyway. Behind my house, another house, and this is everywhere the case, without a roof through which trees grow, weeds, unidentifiable ferns, all as dead and thriving as any architecture of intention, unfulfillment, accident, abandon, with my one useless hand, I eat the plum, and with my other, I throw the pit into the other pit. Um, I'm just going to read two more things. Casual amnesia. Sunday, I saw many people crying at the airport. One man on his phone begging the person on the other line to please stop calling and checking on him. I gathered that the mother of this man at the terminal had died. I was near the end of the chapter of a novel where someone was just about to tell someone else, I love you. He was crying. The man on his phone. He wanted to be alone and couldn't be. Reading felt vulgar and charitable at once, though it was neither of those things. It was just what I was doing, as crying was what he was doing. I wasn't really reading. But he was really crying. When he left, the older man sitting next to him began to cry. And I imagined the situation reminded the older man of a loss in his own life. I didn't think listening alone would have elicited this. Then I remembered a time at the end of college, I saw a young man and young woman embracing, crying, very clearly saying goodbye to one another. And an older woman, perhaps another student's parent, who turned to my friend and I with tears and said, isn't that the saddest thing you've ever seen? And then my friend and I both were crying. Perhaps imagining the woman's sadness came also from some kind of loss, that we had never yet known ourselves what that felt like to say goodbye to a person you love. Certainly, we didn't know what that felt like to remember. Now, I'm remembering a time several years after college when I sat on the roof of an apartment in Philadelphia with that same friend. It was morning. I had been drinking for more than 12 hours. The morning glories with their purple throats open to the sun disgusted me. I had fantasized jumping many times by then. I had been compulsively subjecting myself to different kinds of sexual abjection. And I was crying. It had been a long time since anyone had touched me gently, platonically, unconditionally. Yes, that is the word I am looking for. Free from obligation. I was crying because it was painful to remember when my friend put my head into her lap that I am more than nothing. Which reminds me, and now I am nearly through, of the other friend crying more recently into my shoulder, more recent than the day of airport crying, and how I wanted to transmit to her in that moment the kindness that has been shown to me the way a mineral or library radiates with past encounter. Time moves differently in vessels of earth and paper and person. I came back to the novel I had not really been reading at the airport. 
I was ready for the I love you moment, though regret it never came. Time is full of what we never say to one another. The more you have it, the less it exists. I was looking for sleep, but everything was glass. I kept walking into the walls of corridors I could not perceive. Hello, I would say when my path crossed another's. Hello, I am looking for sleep, only to recognize upon touching the translucent surfaces what it was that came between us, which was only everything. Everywhere, invisible corners and senseless boundaries. But what is sense relative to unrelenting nonsense? I could hear tapping overhead as though the Morse code of a neighbor I would never meet. It was a vast stage, an array of scenes of people oblivious to one another in our respective labyrinths, or perhaps there were no people on the other side or no other side at all. I grew tired. No, I could not remember a time before exhaustion. I saw a person emerging from a yellow jacket nest and sieged with swarm. A legless man walking the perimeter of a gas station with his hands. I saw a woman climbing into a trunk of mud and emerging and re-entering some abject ritual and children shackling the wrists of other children behind their backs and everywhere deeper I went there were others on parallel separate tracks with rising tide and fire at their sides swallowing towers strip malls the rows of houses and hybridized trees above ground pools clothes flapping on the line an abandoned weed whacker leaning on the chain link with a runs good sign mountains of junk of refrigerators and dishwashers the accessories of what i imagined had once been domesticity littering the monstrous coast the railroad flowers that die in the exhaust and then i was running and i was flanked on both sides with streams of people sleeping upright packed so closely they were standing hello I yelled my palms and then my fists upon the glass I'm looking for sleep but they were sleeping and shuddering past me by conveyor and then I saw a child so wretched and untouchable I knew him to be myself pitiful as something something plowing the earth with his horns rutting the long track he walked in his back warped in a question mark of agony I could feel the fur of me bristle with recognition. I was this something, the horizon of this child. He was I, I, he, I wanted to say something to him. He was waiting, I could see, he could see, I could see, I would tell him to rest if I could tell him anything. He thought, I thought I could see, I could see, he thought he was waiting, I was waiting to see. I would tell him I was looking for sleep for you. You see, I thought, he was looking for thought I could see. I would say, I am trying to look at nothing until I see something. I am trying to see, he would tell, of waiting. I thought if I could tell him I see you, I would tell him he never sleeps. I could see him waiting. I was always waiting. I thought when I was him, though I could not tell if sleep was what I needed or if what he was was sleep or what I was was need or want or waiting or what I was was thought or if he could see that he was anything you are, I would tell him you are, you are. He thought, I thought, though he could never tell tell it I saw nor rest and for the rest of time I spoke I told I thought I needed I wanted I waited I waited for sleep but there was no one there and nothing I could do thanks And thank you. So beautiful. <sighs> um, 
wanted to thank our hosts here at Medicine for Nightmares. And earlier I was, you know, I was speaking to this, this disappearance of spaces and such, and, and this is one that we're really um, fortunate to have all of us um, as available as a community space and a space that's available for these kinds of bringing together of people, you know. Um, so try to get yourselves over here more often and, um, you know, partake, use the services of the bookstore, et cetera. Um, Marin Arsanios, I, um, like I said earlier, I encountered at the Poetry Project just through her work there, um, curating and bringing people together. And, and then, um, I don't know, a year or so ago, this book came, uh, not quite. In the October 2022. Okay. So not quite, yeah. So just last last fall, this um, amazing book, the autobiography of a language, um, came from future poem, and um, a little prior to that was this ugly duckling press pamphlet that I had ordered in the mail called Notes on Mother Tongues, and and they did an, an incredible series of pamphlets, and this was one of about twenty people that they published in that series, and. You know, my students and I were reading this book uh, this spring, and they're all writing something on, on their own mother tongue. <laughs> and, um, you know, um, when I opened it up, uh, you know, it, it said, I, I was with a friend, and um, the, the subtitle is Colonialism Class and Giving What You Don't Have. And he immediately said something like, well, that's Jack Lacan. It's like, to someone who doesn't want it, that is love, giving what you don't have, <laughs> you know. Um, and then in, in the book itself is an echo of that, where, where Moran writes, to love in an embarrassing language is to constantly question your ability to transmit an emotion you feel unworthy of receiving. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. So, so Moran Arsanios. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you, Elise. Thank you, Kyle. That was beautiful. I'm um, very tired, but also very energized to be here. So thank you all for coming. Um, so I'm going to be reading prose. And um, I'm going to try to read slowly. I'll read for about 20, 25 minutes. Um, I'll read two pieces from the book. Um, on language, and then I'll read um, two pieces from a newer and rougher collection, so pieces in progress. So the first, um, the first, I don't know how to call them stories or, or I don't know, prose poem, I don't know what it is, an essay, is called Dawn. And it's the opening piece of the collection, and it just kind of introduces my relationship to the English language. So Dawn. My mother abducted us from my father every summer. She took us away to her city, Caracas. At the market, vendors waited plantains, yuca, sometimes carrots, and gave us their best prize, so they said. My mother was a compulsive shopper. She bought everything, anything that could be carried and smuggled back to Montreal where we lived in the 80s. Her shopping skills were impressive, her language specialized. She was an expert at giving instructions, at bargaining, at always obtaining what she wanted. Dawn, my ESL instructor, claims that at expresses a location or a rival in or at a particular place or position. At is a preposition. I could never tell where my mother was at, but I knew where she wanted me to be. When she fell sick and could no longer travel, she flew me to Caracas from Lebanon, my father's country, with a list of foods to purchase. Guavas and mamones and queso guayanes and tequeños. 
I wrapped and smuggled everything back across borders the way she used to and felt momentarily proud. Momentarily means for a very short time. It is an adverb. Very quickly, the pride I felt vanished. Today, it bothers me to evoke my mother through food. I want to separate the word mother from nourishment. I want to uncouple the word mother from mother tongue. Contrarily to what people think, mothers and daughters rarely speak the same language. Microsoft Word underlines contrarily in red. I changed the sentence to contrary to what people think, mothers and daughters rarely speak the same language and the red vanishes. When people ask what language I write in, I say this language. They think that this indicates English, but they're wrong. This is not English. This language is called prose. My ESL teacher claims that the pronoun this is used to refer to the nearer of two things close to the speaker. That, on the other hand, indicates distance. But what if something is both distant and close at the same time? Are those of you sitting nearest to me also the closest? I use the word prose to describe this language, but don't get me wrong, prose puzzles me all the time. I read about it, attend academic lectures and literary talks, and I still don't get it. In the dictionary, prose is defined as plain and dull writing. Dictionaries are tools of consensus. They douse the heat of disagreement with final law-giving words. I've learned not to trust them. But what is your mother tongue? The language you count or dream in, people insist. They want to know. They believe that my subconscious is more reliable than the narrative I am giving them. Uno, dos, tlete, arba, chamse, seis, setet, mana, nueve, diez. I can't blame them for that. This narrative isn't reliable. You can trust me on this one. When I said, I'll explain what I mean by this later, later implied a sequence, an order organizing my thoughts. The sentence, I'll explain what I mean by this later, suggests that meaning is separate from the coming into being of a sentence, that it can be anticipated. Maybe prose means being in the sentence as the sentence is happening in the room. Alternatively, maybe prose means being in this sentence as the sentence is happening in this room. I can never tell, pronouns confuse me. They stand for a referent that is no longer here or there. An object or a subject now elsewhere in another room, a different sentence. At the market in the morning, I clung to my mother's skirt, hiding between her doughy legs. I wanted people to know that my mother and I belonged together, that her sentences were mine too, even if my understanding of her language was limited. What she hadn't passed on to me, I would get by standing close, as if physical proximity could remedy the fact that we were in one but two. When I tell people that my mother tongue is Spanish, they don't believe me. I can't blame them, she, my mother, would also disagree. I speak of my mother in the third person because she isn't in this room and no longer in this life. She, the pronoun, takes the place of an absent noun. I want to ask Dawn, the ESL teacher, if a sentence contains she, where exactly in the sentence is she? Dawn says that I should hold on to my question until the next lesson. In the meantime, I should keep practicing, pronounce my words carefully, imagine having an audience. To learn a language, you must be able to hear it, Don says. Sometimes when I buy vegetables, I can hear myself counting in French. So this is the opening piece of the collection. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> And I'll read the second piece um, called E Autobiography di un idioma. It was a piece commissioned by EFLUX Journal. Um, 
and I wrote it while um, uh, before the pandemic, actually. And um, it's it's a longer piece, but I'll just skip around and read um, different excerpts. So I won't read the the entire piece, but you'll you'll get a sense of it. I am deregulated, a language for which no jurisdiction applies. My past is dirty. All pasts are dirty, though some are filthier than others. I am of the filthier kind. I sit in an evanescent bank account somewhere on the British Virgin Islands. I live here amid a slew of luxury resorts, spas, and white tourists lathered in sunscreen, trailing iridescence in infinity pools. They smoke cigars, inhale tar, sink marriage proposal with blazing sunset. They say I look pretty in my blue, blue robe, compliment my hair the way I keep it silky with avocado oil. They ask questions, what do you do, and are you a uh, un loco? I was born on a nearby island where my mother Elsa was born to her mother Elena, I say. They give me a faint, uninterested smile. To shut me up, they buy me a glass of Sauvignon Blanc. I ask for an extra ice cube, a refill, then another. It took a while, but I've improved at being myself. I can now speak without fatigue. I know everybody here, the elderly and the young. The young believe I'm one of them, but generations do not apply to me. I'm centuries old and have been pregnant for the past 20 years. They, the tourists, think I'm delirious that I've had too much to drink. When they realize that I'm telling the truth, they feel betrayed. What are you talking about? Is this even hasta a un language? I also want to know, why this language? In my mother's bedroom, an old television playing American movies was left on day and, day and night. At first, I thought I was alone, the private recipient of a dialect in black and white, but I soon realized that everyone was concerned and that this expansion was irreversible. It no longer needed ships, the physical vessels of its early dissemination. English scurried ocean bottoms, seamlessly meandering continental distances. I never considered this language to be my own. I do not hate it, I do not love it. It is incidental and life is made of circumstances, outcomes of unruly trajectories. Elsa firmly believed that English would help me find a job in the hotel industry, communicate with tourists, and the world beyond the island. English, she said, always leads to a resolution. It rarely strays from its intention. It means what it says, and it's suited for uneven deals in which one of the parties always leaves slightly fucked. English has fuck in it, a word that gives me great satisfaction. With time, I've learned not to, sh not to lean on shared expressions. They're founded on hard-worn consensus, and their meaning is fixed, sedimented like an island rock. I was entirely honest when I said that I, could, that I could speak without fatigue. The acrobatics of point of view ex are exhausting. I'll have to stop scavenging hotel bars for dregs of white wine, get my narrative straight, find an interlocutor. If we sat facing each other or next to each other at a bar, you'd recognize me because I'm rather petite and wear a finger on each ring. A diagonal scar cuts through my right cheek. I'm average looking with long, wavy hair. We'd have an arrangement. You'd ask me about my life, then I'll tell you about it. How generations, generations are stages of life crafted between sleep and lucidity. How I have come, how I have come to language by tending to my own absence. I would have liked to come to you with something more reliable, like documents, but I'm an oral language, an Afro-Portuguese proto-creole developed on the western coast of Africa and brought over to the Caribbean in the 17th century. That's one of the theories of my genesis. There are others. Dutch and Spanish tagged along at later stages with a few Arawak words. Initially, slave traders and slaves used me to communicate then I was just used. 
The only document in my possession says I was born on the island of Curaçao, north of the Venezuelan shore. Linguists struggle to match my identity to a location. Words travel and land in places that do not match their jurisdiction. Parenthesis. When I say my life, I'm conveying an illusion of ownership propped up by a possessive pronoun, as if my inflections were mine, or as if I could control the way people use me every day to hate or love each other or say nothing with words I make available to them. The latter is particularly tedious if you ask me. Ask me. I'm aware of how much I'm asking of you to believe that I have a life, a body, a, body a, a mother, a daughter, while also being a language, a system with everyday life applications, an abstraction. I myself cannot explain this bizarre predicament, how I came to exist in these multiple contradictory ways. I gave it some thoughts and have come to the conclusion that everybody shares my condition. Millions speak languages that are spoken by them alone. Fucking foreign language is my fetish. I got pregnant with Mauricio, the gardener's son who fingered me in his father's chicken coop, stroking my genitals through repeated orgasms. Have you ever heard a language come? Elena was outraged to see me love such an obviously poor person. Although she was born poor, she married rich twice, an ice factory owner later, a, a paper factory owner. She enjoyed the privileges ownership made available to her. Cleaning ladies, white patios, expensive jewelry, and what it disavowed. Her creole, her darkest skin, her past as an aide in her hairdressing salon, her matriarchal upbringing, her absent father. Elena believed that Spanish was better suited for wealth than creole. She stopped speaking me altogether. Mostly, she used me to withhold information. She expressed her silences in an oral language. I haven't learned how to write about myself without leaning on my human experiences. If I were consistent, I'd begin with descriptions of the island, the geology of its soil, the epitaph of its tombstones, Elena's family, the history of their formation, the mixing of colonizers and colonized, the varying percentage of each in my blood. I am the outcome of that foundational clash, a descendant of European, European imperialism, its subjugation of people and extraction of land. I am of that extraction, a language used to violate and spoken to survive. I sway between these two identities. I have identity issues. And I'll stop here for this story. And thanks. <laughs> Um, and I'll switch gears and um, just read pieces from, um, from a newer collection called The Other Side of Freedom. Mm. And it's a collection in progress um, about many things, but um, uh, financial collapse and mm, labor and... Um, other kind of material realities and motherhood as well. Um, so this one is called uh, People Want Power. And I wrote it um, at the onset of the protest um, that um, were going on in, in Beirut, Lebanon, where my father is from. Um, and well, I talk about this in the piece. So. Okay, I want Luca to fall asleep. When he is awake, all he wants is my dirty socks. He doesn't have language to say, I want. Babies always want something. They want words they don't have so that it can express what they need. Their tiny, their tiny fingers extend to grab anything within and out of reach. When they manage to get the object they desire, they pause in awe of their own feet rather than the object they were able to momentarily possess. I love babies because they don't know property. Nothing belongs to them and nothing does not not belong to them. 
Luca wants me to be with him, to stop scrolling the news on my phone. When he doesn't have my undivided attention, he observes the object that possesses the attention he desires and wants that instead. I turn away slightly, nudging him toward building blocks and stackable rings while I scroll through footage of protests, people demanding the collective decapitation of the ruling class. There is no electricity to charge laptops or keep the meat frozen. A father wearing a surgical face mask robs a pharmacy at gunpoint for a box of diapers. Women bleed through their pants, tucking padded paper in, this, in their stained underwear. I hand my phone over to Luca. He doesn't want it anymore. For a long time, I said, I want a baby. A body besides mine I could claim for myself. Love guaranteed through sheer force of habit. When my mother was alive, she wanted me for herself. With her, I learned not to want what I desire. I want Luca to want what he needs for himself. I often wonder, is wanting a baby an inherited desire? A reproduction of the heterosex heterosexist family norm of capitalism is dependent on for its survival. I like a photo of a, a graffitied wall that says, I came from the future to see this. I like images of ATMs torched, smashed, and hammered for not dispensing, mo dispensing money saved over a lifetime. I understand the violence needed to abolish violence. Ask Luca if he wants milk. He takes the bottle and gulps, lulling himself to sleep. I want capitalism to end so that I can desire something other than its extinction. Now that I have a child, I no, longer I no longer think I want a baby. At the end of capitalism, will we be able to relate to objects without owning them or understand that babies do not belong to the ones that made them, but only to themselves? So that's the <laughs> baby part. Um, and I'll read one last piece um, called The Commission. And, um, this one is very much in progress, so it's it's a little rough, but um, um, but I I still want to read it, um, so I'll I'll um, okay I'll, I'll stop I, I will stop justifying the piece and I'll read it. There are some parts that are not fully resolved, but um, but okay, here it is, the commission. Um, I won't be writing today. All the words that follow stand for words I haven't written and will, um, and will most probably never write. What you are reading now are ghost sentences, hollow syntactic shells scattered on a brightly lit page. When I try typing words like page or occupation, my keyboard releases a nauseating stench. The software is long rotten, compromised from within. Can you smell it too? Writers often say that they don't have time to write. They say this all the time. But this situation is different. I call it situation because I can't think of another word which is part of the problem or situation, which began as a series of short interruptions that incrementally resulted in the cessation of all productive activities. After hours spent looking at my screen, aborting sentences before they could reach their own conclusions, I eventually yielded to the page, its luminous and stubborn refusal. This is the last page I will ever write and the first page I will ever not write. Before I go on, you should know that I'm not the problem. I've always been a dependable writer, someone you could count on to submit her work, if not ahead of time, then at least by the deadline. I've been trained to handle interruptions as integral parts of the workflow, but this situation is of a more radical nature. Although I feel personally targeted, I know that the problem extends beyond the failures of this particular commission. Something larger is at stake, something like air but denser and harder to breathe, something perniciously shaping our perception of what is possible and what isn't. The problem or situation began with an email an invitation to write an essay for a prestigious magazine. I won't name here. 
I enthusiastically replied that I would do it. I was thrilled to be considered for their issue. Thank you for thinking of me was, I think, the last thing I ever wrote. My fingers went on strike shortly after, rallying with other protesting organs, eyes, lower back, inner thighs. Their demands were loud but unintelligible. They refused to perform movements aimed at the completion of a task. They no longer wanted to write sentences as if sentences were a goal, add words to more words that would eventually result in a book, a physical object held by other equally worn out hands. My body felt tired, overworked, underappreciated. It demanded a cessation, a clear cut separation from the self who refuses to stop working. I insisted that I had ethics. I was a fair and equitable employer. I've always treated my fingers equally, massaged them at the end of a workday with wipe shea butter and essential oils, peppermint and lavender. What were they hoping to obtain by sabotaging our inherent interdependence? I refused to hire another pair of hands. I've never, I'd never outsource my sentences and no technology can yet substitute for the physical act of writing without sacrificing the singular sensation of not knowing what words will follow those that were just typed. I haven't written a single word since the commission. Not writing a single word is hard work, more work than writing many words. All the words I haven't written un undoubtedly exceed the 4,000 word essay I was initially commissioned to write. All the words I haven't written exist as infinite iterations of what they could have been. Had it been written, this essay could be truly exceptional. Worth the time you take away from your own work, the hours you steal from your children, if you have children, or from the people you care for. Care requires time. I promised my daughter Mina to feed her soon. Can she wait a little? Play with her stuffed animals while mama is working. She reaches for the moon-shaped silver ring on my nightstand, aiming it at her toe. I wear rings as a civilizational device, an appendage to keep my fingers tamed. When I'm done staring at the wordless page on my screen, I give my daughter what she wants, the attention so essential to her nurturance. I express love through a phoneless and highly alert presence. Carry me, she demands reaching for a dictionary on my shelves. I hesitate. Since the strike, my fingernails have grown into thick claw-like appendixes, physical picket lines protecting my finger's idleness. Mina's body is covered with cat-like scratches and I haven't masturbated in a month. I promise Mina to take her to the nail salon with me. She insists on wanting sun-colored nails. My employer, by which I mean the self currently employing me, is accusing me of mismanagement. She claims that I've extended my operations to my chest, hips, dull and persistent strains, throbbing ligaments, the lipoma popping like a little mound on my right clavicle, and now my jittery, uncooperative fingers, all subsumed under an ego conglomerate manufacturing sentences for miserable wages. Fine, I haven't been the best employer, but can you really blame me? You're asking me to perform the impossible, to work both for and against myself. I feel caught between a rock and a hard place, although I struggle to visualize the specifics of the hard place and the expression. I make a mental note, avoid using generic statements at all costs. I try negotiating, but the words coming out of my mouth don't represent what I truly think. My lips insist on remaining neutral. I can't look at myself in the mirror without resenting the hypocrisy of their smile. I distrust the close relationship they have with my fingers, the way they've made up a language they excluded me from. I've taken all the mirrors off the dusty walls of my apartment. I feel betrayed by a reflection that insists on dissociating itself from the self it represents. 
If I could write, I would write that the thing causing the trouble disguises itself as love, as in the sentence, I love what I do, I truly do. A love premised on the betrayal of one of my most fundamental sources of pleasure, the hands I've sucked on, licked, repeatedly fisted, and that now demand compensation for the essay I haven't written. An essay that addresses the way the entire industry is premised on a fucked up kind of love, an effective commitment to the craft that justifies subjugation. The argument goes as follows. The more you love something or someone, the less you should expect to receive anything in return. Love can be adequately compensated, so why compensate it at all? To sell your love conditionally is shameful, unworthy of love altogether. In exchange for your devotion to the craft, you will be given something your meager imagination struggles to quantify. To be a writer is to let go of any form of attachment to outcome, to unseat time as investment, not expect anything in return for your efforts or financial sacrifices. Nothing belongs to you while your time belongs to others, employers, children, lovers. This is a profession that pretends it isn't one. A profession that believes it can skirt the transactional logic of the page. A profession that is allegedly in the business of expressing our deepest existential struggles while being entirely unable to reckon with the material conditions of its own existence is what I would have written had I had the words. Pearls of heavy sweat roll down the nail technician's, nails, nail technician's forehead as she tries to find my claws. It's not working, she says, not working. She charges me an additional $10 for all the nail files she had to discard. Massages my wrists, defeated by the resistance she encounters. Muscular tissues twisted, twisted into dense, painful knots. I try negotiating with my fingers by engaging my lips. What if, for example, I wrote about not writing? I ask them to grant me one last email. I need to notify the commissioner of the status of my piece, but they won't bulge. I never emailed back the prestigious magazine. I never submitted the piece. In fact, I never wrote it. Thank you. so much, Miran. Um, we did say that there would be some kind of conversation afterward, and I don't have any desire to really steer that conversation. So I would ask um, Kyla and Miran if they could come up and maybe talk a bit with one another and open the floor to each of you to, to bring forward what you would um, like to bring. You know, so is that okay? For a few minutes, a few minutes, yeah. Um, I find it v incredibly thrilling that your writing can ride this continued propulsive wave of writing about writing. Mm -hmm. Like there, it, 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 it sort of feels like, um, mm -hmm. there, there's never an excuse for stopping, um, mm -hmm. and... I wonder how that's relating to parenthood, <laughs> because I also observe a lot of a, a, a lot of response to um, like continued input of a subject that you don't uh, of a, a human subject that like mm -hmm. is autonomous okay. from you and also like um, dependent on you. Right. Well, I'm very impressed that you could pull out a such a Sophisticated question. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, thanks for that question. Um, I I like what you said about um, 
writing about writing, and I think, you know, initially when I started writing and I decided to write in English, I was thinking, oh, well, I'll have to write about the language I'm writing in because I need to, it, it isn't a natural language for me, and I need to make that relationship visible. And so uh, it just felt like it was almost like a rite of passage into writing that I, I, I had to address this question. And, um, and then I feel like once I had addressed it, well, I've always been uh, attracted to writers who think, like, uh, who have this kind of meta relationship to language while also staying in narrative. So for example, Rene Gladman, who, you know, thinks about the sentence on the page, how the sentence, how the sentence work as it is happening, as it unfolds on the page. And actually, I also want to connect this to your work because I feel also there's this performative element to your work in which you're really sort of acting the sentence while you read. Um, and so I wanted to not, like I'm not a, a performative reader, but I do want the sentence to be um, happening in the present moment. Like I want the reader to be aware of language as it is working on the page while also being a, uh, a participant in a, in a narrative or in a story. So that was a kind of model I was, uh, these ideas that um, I was interested in. And, and recently it was because of motherhood actually, I had way less time to write. And also I was adjuncting and doing so many different things. And um, it was during the pandemic and uh, it was a financially precarious time and I'm a single parent. And so all these, all these questions of um, time, reproductive labor, uh, I had to connect them to writing again and thinking just about writing, like what allows me to, what material conditions would allow me to write and um, not only me, like what materials, what material conditions allow for literature to emerge um, and what is needed for, for time to exist, you know, <laughs> in terms of what, yeah, and um, who, can, who can afford this, who can afford that time. Um, and yeah, so I don't know. So now I want to, I want to redirect the question and ask you about perhaps your, you know, uh, you know the the performative nature of your work and how um, time works for you in your in your writing. I I think it's the first time I see you read, and I was deeply uh, moved by your pieces, and also I was I was moved by the by how beautifully sort of. Uh, composed the pieces were in terms of how you frame the silences and how you you're very um, the the conversation is is there it's staged but it, it feels very very real um, as you're reading it so yeah I wonder what what you think about about um, time and presence. Um. I'm gonna respond to that by again going back to something in your reading, which was I really loved the the passage in Dawn where you're saying um, this is not English, like this this language that I'm writing in is not English, and you say like this language maybe this language is prose, mm -hmm. um, and and I feel that um, even more specifically, it feels evident that like this language that you're working in is a language which is continuously self-knowing of being a language. Mm -hmm. and, and kind of, is, it's like um, really like rich and uncontainable with that mm -hmm. knowing. For me, language is like very firstly primarily physical mm -hmm. and it's a, um, it's like a residue of physical sensation. Um, and I think I'm interested in vocabularies that maybe aren't 
apparent to us as words, and that's part of where the physical experience of reading enters for me. Um, and I think that um, that kind of movement and embodiment is a sort of like harmonious parallel grammar to the language that's happening on the page and they um, conduct one another. Um, and they also um, respond to the limitations of one another. Because I'm really, I'm, I'm very interested in the places where words end or fail or can't reach. And that's also why like compositionally in just the kind of word matter of what I'm writing, I'm really excited about the kind of like pivot and fulcrum points of words. And like the line break is really exciting to me and I, I'm really interested in the volatility of what happens before and after the line break and where words are kind of um, like seesawed in different directions. Um, so it's like I just have a lot of appetite. <laughs> And um, and I I want like everything that's available, um, and um, and certain modes of expression don't have certain qualities available, so they synthesize with other modes of expression. Um, When you say, I also feel there's almost there's also kind of a um, a somatic also component or the way that like memory also is is present in the body while you're you know reading and performing and um, yeah I, it just it becomes. So these multiple dimensions that you're sort of activating, right? Like the past and the present and, and how the page, so you're saying the page is not enough? I'm just, I'm I actually, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think I have, I'm, I think the, the, I think it's really difficult for me that a primary technology of poetry is like a fixed object. Mm -hmm. um, as much as I love, books and journals and like printed matter. Um, but I find poetry to, like I experience poetry as so much more anarchic and also circulatory and social. And I know that, I know that books are a part of that. Like I know that books are a part of that experience that I'm describing, but, um, but, um, I think I think part of the part of what I hit with the with the page is like its fixity within time, mm -hmm. um, and obviously that fixity gets unsettled by different readers approaching it yeah. because that then they transform the page, sure. but like the 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 object itself. It's um, it's you know its quality of being held <laughs> is um, is like thrilling and also maddening for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it actually makes me think about again. I, I keep going back to her, but Brenda Gladman. I, I remember when she once said in a in a conversation or interview that for her the page kind of vibrates and there's like a texture to the page that, you know, every time she approaches the page, like, you know, there is a, a kind of event. Um, and she's also someone who's concerned with ways of like, how can I expand, you know, on the page? Like, how can I stretch the page beyond, you know, its traditional usage and, um, and how can I, Drawing, I, I guess, like for her, drawing was a was an answer to these limitations. Um, but I guess it's probably 
I'm just trying to kind of connect the feelings of like wanting wanting more or wanting more than the page, yet also working with it. Um, yeah, working with its constraints, but also, yeah, thinking of ways of, of expanding it as well. I feel like that's also like, a, that's a response to what you're saying about like, what do we do with this condition that there's not enough time? Mm -hmm. And I think that like how we become bandits of time is like we find those places of sort of disobedient pleasure. Mm. Um, which I also really experience in the ways that you're writing autobiography and memoir. It's like, yeah. you know, we're going to be writing about my mother and we're going to be writing about my language teacher, but actually these are going to become opportunities for me to like move dimensionally in a totally different yeah. direction. Yeah. Um, and I think that kind of um, like subversion is, produces time mm -hmm. because it's outside of um, it's outside of like what we what one is expected to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so you're like, well, I'm just I'm going to go off the clock, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah, I, and I think for me, I know where I find kind of if any freedom. Uh, when I write is when I find these devices that allow me to um, explore something outside of certain expectations of how, you know, an autobiography is supposed to be, you know, the author is narrating their own life story. But um, I wanted to write a fictional autobiography or I wanted to write a a biography from the perspective of the language, right? The language becomes a character. So that kind of fictional device allowed me to think about things I wouldn't have thought of otherwise. And just how these devices kind of can activate different parts of your imagination or just make you think differently about language. You know, imagine, you know, a language as a person. What, how would they speak? What would they say about themselves? So. Yeah, I, I think, um, and this is why I don't think I'm a fiction writer, but I'm interested in fictional devices because um, I think they, they just allow for a detachment from the immediate self uh, that in which I find a lot of freedom. And this is also my, my I have like a conflictual, not conflictual, but like tense relationship with confessional writing. Um, and I also think about confessional writing in another piece in the collection, but when the self is too attached to itself, I feel like it doesn't give me enough space to kind of move in different directions or, I don't know, I see people nodding. Do, do are there questions from, from the audience or anything? Yes. in a way about distance mm -hmm. and the, the, the necessary distance required to do any kind of writing of the self or with the self. Mm -hmm. And I want to think about distance at the level of language at both of the, I think both of your concerns with the idea of mother language. You know, I'm, I'm from Bangladesh, a country that's founded on the idea of a mother language and that sort of tie between, um, of course, ideas of family, lineage, blood with the nation itself and motherhood. I actually think that one of the things that is sort of characteristic of the category that is much more reviled now because it's been sort of uh, characterized as diasporic writing. Mm -hmm. The idea of both writing with one's, like a foreign tongue, a mother tongue, but also writing against it. And there's been so much wonderful work, both theoretically, poetically, artistically, on mm -hmm. the idea of ownership, of coloniality, mm -hmm. and, and language that both of you have touched on so beautifully. Mm -hmm. And I think the idea of diaspora, as it is characterized, is so much about loss, and the, the sort of nostalgia of loss, and this place is 
mm -hmm. perhaps. But I find in conversations with my own community and other members of you know, my wider circle that we can also think of diaspora as something generative, you know, something that is not just about loss, but about fecundity and profundity and a lot of multiplicity. How, how are you guys sort of both thinking about the idea of possession, loss, of distance, um, in, in writing in the ways that you do? Mm -hmm. I have to digest for a okay. second. Okay. <laughs> I, really I know I have a feeling. <laughs> I think uh, diaspora is so complicated because it's it's also not one thing. Uh, I feel like even just thinking about diaspora historically, how different diasporas have emerged at different moments of time. So, for example, now I have a there's a very big community of um, um, Arab and Middle Eastern um, um, artists, and you know. Um, writers that have moved to Berlin in the recent years. So there's a huge, like, including many friends from, there's been a huge exodus from Lebanon and um, into different parts of the world. And uh, there's a big community right now in, in Berlin. And, um, you know, and that's, that's it's, it's almost like a historical moment because there's this, this convergence of like, you know, these failed revolutions and everyone just like left the countries, those who could and, you know, and I'm, I'm trying to think about how that diaspora is probably different from, you know, um, other previous diasporas or previous diasporic formations and what makes it specific to this moment of time. So I guess what I'm trying to say is diaspora responds because there's different like various temporalities to diaspora. There's, there's the longing towards like, you know, the motherland or the past or looking back and a certain kind of melancholy that goes with the, you know, the experience of being uh, diasporic, yet there's also like a very, um, you know, uh, specificity to, to uh, being from a specific kind of diaspora in a specific place that makes that experience very present rather than like, you know, um, looking towards the past. So I'm thinking here about the generative part of your question. Um, and I don't know where I'm going with this, but I think, you know, there's a lot of, I think what I resist from diaspora is, is, the, is the melancholy. I think there's a kind of almost like depoliticizing effect to the melancholy. And I feel like I, I, I understand the loss, but I also don't wanna, um, I don't wanna freeze, uh, you know, this, you know, a certain cultural identity in time. Like this is what I'm resisting. And I think in writing, what allows me to 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 work against that is precisely this, these fictional devices that are kind of speculative. So looking, you know, using speculation as a way of imagining a different kind of time, space, or future that resists this kind of, you know, um, the forging of a melancholy and the forging of a kind of static, you know, relationship to one's um, homeland, if that makes sense. For me, at least, that, that's how I experience it. Yeah, I think I'm with both of you. I think that, like, there's a way of conceiving diaspora as the place and not the condition. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that can be really rich with freedom from attachments of ideas of places and what places are or were. And I, yeah, I don't really, um, I don't experience my like some degrees removed diasporic position as one of like longing for something that has been erased, even as I recognize that that erasure has happened and continues to happen. I have a kind, I'm, I've, I've been trying to formulate some like complementary idea, like, you know, we have oceanic feeling and I also really experience diaspora with a kind of archipelagic feeling. Mm -hmm. And I think about that because the, that's the, that's the diaspora that I come from is, a, is an archipelago. Yeah. 
Um, and I think about this, you know, in the way that oceanic feeling is like a, a feeling of deep connection with something that is kind of unfathomably vast and distant. I, I'm thinking of archipelagic feeling as like, I'm deeply connected to islands I don't know, mm -hmm. you know? And there, there are these, they're, they're, they're atomized from one another. And at the same time, they are within one another's transits. Mm -hmm. And I'm also a part of that island system. Mm -hmm. um, cool. And, and um, there's, a, there's a feeling of both deep kinship and separation that I find actually like quite pleasurable. Mm -hmm. um, even as it is, I think that, that, you know, longing can definitely be an element of, of pleasure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you say, ar archi what's the word? I say archipelagic, but. Archipelagic. Is that, uh, is that also in, com like, in, in Glissant's understanding of the poetics of relation, the archipelago. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everybody.